Hello, my name is Sophie, and I'm going to be talking all about this tonguing ice pod, or Smithsonian exigua, which you might be thinking must be a terrifying creature because it eats tongues. But if I just move to the right, it's this little, little guy. <laughs> Now, first things first, this parasite was first classified by these two guys in 1884. They're in all of these taxonomic groups, from Animalia to Isopoda, all the way down to their species name of Smithsonian exigua. And if you look in the image above me, by Charles and Barish in 2006, females tend to be wider while also being longer than the males are. Globally, they can be found in all the places where there's dots on this map. Uh, mainly in the Americas, especially the Gulf of California, uh, Mexico and South America, but also in Asia and Oceania. When it comes to their life cycle, juveniles first attach themselves to the gills of the fish, where they'll then mature into males. If there's females already present in or on the fish, uh, none of them will then mature into females, but if there's not, one of them may mature into a female. From that, mating then occurs in the gills, creating new juveniles, which then search for a new host using scent, which is what Cook 2012 found. If we go back to the original host, the female on that fish will move to the mouth and sever the blood vessels in the tongue, making it fall off. And then using its back claws, it attaches itself to the left of a stub where it spends the rest of its life feeding on the host's uh, blood and mucus and while also gaining uh, protection, which could potentially show how it evolved this like thing to be able to survive. Eventually, the fish does die, it, usually not from the parasite, but it can be in like some rare cases. Usually the host is just anemic. Uh, it then atta detaches itself and then clings to the head or the body of the fish. And then apart from that, not much else is known about this parasite in terms of its life cycle. We know that Smithsonian exhibit only parasitizes fish, but what species does that include? Well, it mainly includes snappers such as the Colorado snapper, and the northern red snapper as well as the jordan snapper you've also got clownfish and grunts being parasitized as well as drum species too the easiest way to diagnose a host is if they're missing a tongue quite obviously or if the parasite can be seen attached to the fish's head or body like in the image on my right here the host can also become anemic or underweight have organ damage or have a pathogen as a result of the parasite which could then lead to the death of the fish. In regards to the management of this parasite, Rajesh Kumar and Ravi Chandran in 2014 wrote a whole paper about how uh, parasitic isopods have a greater effect in the aquaculture industry than in wild populations. The, in these industries there's also non-traditional hosts which can also be bad so there's a lot more management schemes that happen in these places than in wild populations. This can include uh, one, uh, placing mesh, small little holes of mesh nets around the cages so the juveniles can't swim into where the fish are, uh, as well as placing the cages in strong currents and also conditions where the parasite might not be able to live, so then the parasites won't be there in the first place, or using chemical treatments such as insecticides, uh, which would then kill off the parasite without doing any harm to the fish. Due to the large impact that Smithsonian zebra has in these aquaculture facilities, it can then have a knock-on effect with profit. This can be because of more smaller and unhealthy fish, uh, the non-traditional host creating even more smaller and unhealthy fish, and then the prevention methods are then costly to prevent this. Overall, these three things eat into the profit that the facility can be making. It, however, not everything is as bad as it seems, because if you look in the US, for example, where the parasite is quite prevalent, they still use fisheries quite a lot, so and then their profit isn't affected as much as it could be. Uh, but if you were to take China, where the parasite isn't that common, but they use aquaculture quite a lot, as well as providing around 38% of the global fish production, if they were to then get some so uh, like outbreaks, it could then have a knock-on effect affecting uh, overall just reduction in fish and profit for them, which would be bad. If we look at wild populations and overfishing, it could then lead to there being less hosts and then the, the parasite dying out, or the parasite looking for new hosts in new types of fish, which then begs the question, should we conserve the parasite, which is a whole debate in itself. So if you want to check out these two papers, they explain it much better if you want to learn more. Smithsonian exigua can even be found in popular culture, such as in the film called The Bay, which is a horror mockumentary, as well as uh, a surrealist horror game, which is called How the Fish is Made, showing how socially this parasite is seen as a scary thing.
I hope you've enjoyed learning about the tongue and ice pod. If you want to learn more, check out the various websites and papers throughout. Bye-bye.